Really, the goal is just to use our stories to bring veterinary medicine to life for the pet caretakers of the world. Uh, and we're doing it because we believe that educating these caretakers is the most powerful thing that we can do to improve the life quality of all of the pets that we love. Hey everybody, uh, Dr. Natalie Keith here. And Dr. Jessica Eastup. This is Vet Tales. And we're going to talk to you today about spaying and neutering your pets. Spay and neuter. Yeah, it's apparently November is um, Prevent a Litter Month. That's the it's name a good of month. it. Yeah. Yeah, I just thought it was an interesting way of phrasing that. Phrasing yeah. that. Yeah. Like, I want to be like Bob Barker, though, and be like, don't remember, forget. don't forget, mm-hmm. spay and neuter your pets. The end of every episode. End yeah. of every episode for <laughs> decades. Yeah. Um, which is, yeah, it is important, but I guess, yeah, I mean, you know, preventing a litter is important, but there's, like, so much more that's going into that decision. Right, there's so much more behind it, like, you know, um, how they grow, how their hormones change, and cancer later on down the road. Yeah, um, pros and cons list yeah, for days. Yeah, and definitely wanting to prevent unwanted litter, litters is important because of the population crisis we kind of have in the yeah. U.S. with especially, dogs. Yeah, especially in Oklahoma. Like, mm-hmm. I feel like some states are way better at this than us. Like, Colorado, I know they, like, a lot of stray dogs get taken to Colorado because oh. they don't have an overwhelming stray population, and yet people are, like, really into um, adopting pets as opposed to, like, purchasing. Gotcha. That's great. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So, there, I mean, there is some hope that we can get there get there mm-hmm. like with just like modifying our human mm-hmm. behaviors yeah yeah That's hence the, the prevent a litter month yeah yeah that makes sense yeah um so so i think you know it's something so first of all i just want to say dr Eastep does a, a large bulk of the spays <laughs> and neuters um at north side because surgery is kind of her jam yes i like doing them yeah you have some today right Yes, got a couple. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so that's um, her next project. They're getting those patients' blood work ran and everything. Let's which... go do those. Yeah, yeah. So um, first, I think uh, we just want to talk about, like, you know, why do we or don't we spay or neuter mm-hmm. cats and dogs and the reasons we're making which decision because it obviously is different for every pet. And then we can talk about, like, maybe you can tell us a little bit about the procedure. Yeah. And then we can talk about, like, aftercare and, yeah. and so forth. Yeah. Cool. Sounds good. Okay. Well, um, so first of all, what? let's talk about cats first because we always talk about dogs first. Let's yeah. just like, mix it up a little bit. What are your recommendations on cat spays and neuters? Yeah. So um, I recommend doing them at six months of age regardless Yeah. Um, of breed, of whether it's spaying or neutering. Um, that's because cats don't typically grow that much more from six months of age to adulthood yeah um but also they can start breeding at six months of age boy howdy can't they yes they are Um, quick i've seen lots of kittens come in that were already pregnant at nine months of age Mm -hmm. um or having kittens at that point and cats they like to have kittens yeah especially in the spring yes so um for them it's a kind of a hard fast rule of Five to six months. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, um, just to, like, poke the other side of this bear a little bit, um, some, uh, like, just out of necessity, a lot of, like, shelters and things will recommend spaying kittens, like, immediately, like, right. eight, nine, ten weeks old. Yeah. Um, will you touch just a little bit on, like, why as, when we're more, like, family pet oriented versus population control oriented, yeah. why do we typically not do that? Yeah, because... You really don't need to Mm -hmm. at that early. Um, You know, when they're that young, you have a little bit more concerns about their anesthetic risk. Yeah. um, That you don't have to take if they're a family-owned pet versus if, you know, they were taken up off the streets and there's the potential they might go back. Yeah. Um, And so wanting to get them done as early won't necessarily hurt female cats later on down the line um, as much as potentially male cats. Yeah. But also you're wanting to control the population. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's a double-edged sword. Like, so I get why shelters do it. And then, you know, the reason that we don't recommend early, Mm -hmm. especially like you were saying, the males, um, for us, it's really about the, what we call the block Tom, which is, I've always like questioned, like, why do we call it the block Tom when it's almost always neutered males? (laughs) But I guess our Toms, Toms don't have a different name once they're neutered. So I guess they're still Toms. I guess, yeah. I don't know. Someone can Google that. Yeah. Is there? I thought, I don't know. (laughs) Yeah, we may have to look into that. Like, like, you know. We've always just called it. Yeah, but I mean, when you think about it, it's like, if you spayed a cow, she's still a cow. 
Yeah. But a bull is a steer once yeah. they're neutered. I think it so, depends on the animal. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, we're going to have to do some Googling on that. But anyway, so block toms, essentially what, <clears throat> what happens is if they are neutered too early in life, their hormonal development of your genital tract is kind of truncated, mm-hmm. um, cut short to a degree, and that, that urethra can be um, smaller and so forth, and they are more inclined to obstruct with urinary crystals or like mm-hmm. get or fiber stones, clots yeah. or stones or things like that that will occlude the urethra and if they become blocked if the urinary passage is blocked it is life threatening within days like really fast really fast yeah. and um and then they're just more prone to it like mm-hmm. for life if they've ever blocked once you have to really watch those guys yes. so yeah um and it's you know it's something you see in male cats a lot in general um but i think with the higher risk of neutering them earlier, you're risking those things, so you're going to run into that problem a little more. Um, goats actually have the same problem, so. <laughs> yes, and they have that weird little squirrely bit at the yeah, end. Uh, the urethral worse. process. Yes. And, uh, yeah, that little thing, it's amazing. Even urine fits through that. Yeah. It's so tiny. Yeah. So, um, anyway, yeah, so that's that's kind of the cat thing is, um, you know, AHA, you, what was their little slogan that they had? The American um, Animal Hospital Association says... Fix felines by five. Fix felines by five, yeah. Mm-hmm. Which, so we say six because of the males, but, like, for females, I think five is, yeah. like, definitely fine. Yeah, definitely. And I cannot stress how many times I've seen kittens, like, nine-month-old kittens that have come in pregnant yeah. already. So, you know, five yeah. to six months is the time. Do but, not dilly-dally. Yeah. Yes, especially in the spring and summer yeah. months. Yeah. Um, okay, just, I have to, I have to interject because I've Googled it. <laughs> I, I literally never have heard this in my life, but this is what it says from the cats.org um, that once a female cat has become, so, so they are already like a little bit, I don't trust them because they say once a female cat has been neutered, which of course uh, females are spayed, yeah. um, they become a molly and when what? a neuter, I, <laughs> and when, a, when a neutered male, a, a, while a neutered male cat is known as a Gib, G I B. I've never heard this. No, yeah. So I don't know. But then also, so if we go to like Wikipedia, it says a male cat is called a tom or a tomcat or a gib if neutered, and a female called a queen, uh, mm-hmm. which when they have kittens, it's called queening, which I think is adorable. Um, they are called mollies if spayed. Um, so, uh, so we have a, a Wikipedia context as well confirming this molly and gib. In my eight years of education, I have never heard that. Uh, in my 20 years in this field, in my 40 years of having cats, never have I yeah. ever. Wow. Well, hey, you learn something new every day. Boy, don't I. <laughs> yeah. You're welcome, guys. I'm so glad you tuned in today. <laughs> Molly and Gib. Um, it sounds like cat names. They do. I know. I may, My next male cat, I might name him Gib. <laughs> I don't know. Probably not. Probably not. <laughs> like Gibbs or Gibson. <laughs> My husband names all of our uh, cats and sometimes dogs off of uh, John Wayne characters. So oh, that's perfect. Yeah, we had yeah. the general Sterling oh, Price. Yeah. So, anyway, uh, okay, so that's cats in and of uh, itself. Um, they don't get membrane cancer as often, so we don't talk mm. about that as much yeah. with them. It's really about pregnancy. Yeah, pregnancy a lot with them. So um, let's let's creep into the the canine section. Um, they kind of break down differently, so. They do, um, because one, there's so many different sizes of dogs. Yeah. Um, and a lot more to take into account. Of course, population is also a concern for dogs, um, and how much they breed as well. Um, they typically don't start breeding until about a year of age, but I have seen pregnant puppies as well. Yeah, yeah, I've seen them at 10 months get pregnant, Mm -hmm. but it is far less common. Yeah, yeah. For sure. Um, so with dogs, you kind of run in. Uh, the rule is to you want to spay them before the first heat cycle. Yes. Um, which is typically can happen between six to nine months of age yep. for dogs. So um, with that, it's because the more heat cycles they have, um, you know, the first couple, you increase the risk of mammary cancer later on in life. Yeah. Yeah. What? So when I was in school, they told us um, that the first. If you, if you can catch it before the first heat cycle and spay them, you reduce their chance of mammary cancer later in life by, like, 92%. Yeah. And then it was, like, 70% after the second one or mm-hmm. something like that. Is that... 
S- what, somewhere what around doing? there, I, I recall being taught, you know, before the first heat cycle, you reduce it by somewhere around 80%. After the second heat cycle, you've only reduced it by 33%. And then after the third, you're kind of... I wonder if those numbers are going down because, like, cancer is just more common. Could be, or we're identifying it more. Yeah, um, that could be. So, kind of, in that same ballpark, the gist is you want to spay them before their first heat cycle. Yeah. If they're a smaller breed dog. Yeah. Um, when you get into your large breed dogs, spaying them too early may cause other problems later on in life. So, it's it's a balancing act of spaying them at the right time. Um so they don't have a ton of health issues. <laughs> right, which, you know, sometimes we can't avoid, but, like, we don't want to cause any problems. Right, right. So what are some of the health issues that we're worried about because that we may be spayed mm-hmm. or neutered too early? For large breed dogs, um, a lot of orthopedic issues. Yeah. So, um, you know, ligaments, tearing, um, dysplasia, hip dysplasia, um, joint mobility problems, things like that, um, where they didn't have the hormone in their body long enough to develop, to develop properly. properly. Yeah. yeah that whole um, so for them, the recommendation is to spay between nine to 15 months of age. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, and it's tough because, you know, you can have females going into heat with the males is a lot less complicated. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I say that, you know, you, there are other variables that are at play, but like, for example, I have a 95, five pound German shepherd who was, uh, he, his name is Ruben, and which is a John Wayne character, um, <laughs> just in case you guys are doing some fact, check, fact checking, it's a Rooster J. Cogburn's actual name from True Grit is Ruben, um, but it was also my grandpa's middle name and my mom's favorite sandwich, that. and it's in the Bible, so there's like so many reasons that I wanted <laughs> my dog to be named Ruben, and it just so happened that I was able to I love that. find a John Wayne to make it pass uh. with, the, with the husband. Um, so anyway, he's a 95 pound German Shepherd, and what I did was waited for him to start hiking. Mm-hmm. Um, those marking behaviors, I was like, nope, we're not learning that. Mm-hmm. And so uh, he was about 11 and a half months when uh, he picked his leg up for the first time. And so it just nearly a year old when we neutered. Right, right. So that was that was kind of the breaking point for me. I waited as long as I could without having behavioral issues. Right, right. And that's an important thing, too. Um, male dogs, you know. They want to roam, mm-hmm. um, especially if they know if smell a lady. Yeah. yeah. So um, you don't want them to roam or get hit by a car, get yeah. found, get taken, you know, all those things. Um, so. Yeah. In all of my years of emergency work, I would say the hit by car and dog fight dogs, I would say 75% of them were intact males. I'd agree with that. Yeah. Because they were just getting in trouble. That's what they do. <laughs> they weren't, yeah, they weren't thinking clearly. Yeah. So uh, making uh, definitely on wise risk decisions yeah, sure. so so yeah that's something to think about um so what i typically will tell my clients on the males and females as i say you know let's shoot for 10 months especially mm-hmm. if they're going to be super large dogs right you know if they're just like a little pity or something that's going to be like kind of your 60 pound dog i don't stress but when we start getting into the goldens the shepherds mm-hmm. the dobies the you know and then the the big dogs like great pyrenees and stuff i will you know, say, let's get as close to a year as we can. Right, right. And then you get to Great Danes. <laughs> yeah, and sometimes uh, Great Dane owners, they'll they'll get pretty passionate about this, and they'll want to wait until the dog is two, and yeah. and that's fine. Um, uh, you know, you, I guess, you know, you lose your, your reduction in the mammary cancer. Right. But also, that's not really, the the Great Danes, that's not their biggest problem. Yeah, you don't The Golden, that. yes. Yes. Uh, but that's, not great dates. That's not as common in that breed, and they certainly have so much more growing to do and so much more bone and joint development. To yeah, do. and they're so much more likely to develop something like osteosarcoma. Right, right. Um, and those bony cancers, and we can actually reduce the risk of those theoretically. There's a lot of research on this still, but um, theoretically we could reduce the rate of osteosarcoma by delaying that in right. those giant, like, giant breeds. Huge breed dogs, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, because there's a lot of stuff going in there. Um. Another yeah. thing for female dogs especially is you want to spay them. You don't want to just let them go through life not being spayed because they can develop what's called a pyometra, yeah. um, which is basically a pus-filled uterus. Yeah. And I, as I described to clients, it's basically a pus balloon, and yeah. it fills up, and it will burst. Um, yes. And it 
is very life threatening. Yeah, yeah, especially if they um, if they have what's called a closed pyometra, where the the discharge of this this you know purulent exudate mm-hmm. is a nice word for pus, um, and where it if it cannot drain out, that's when that that balloon fills up to the point of bursting, and yeah. those dogs can die very quickly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and so um, it's just not really great for them to continue to go through heat cycle after heat cycle if your intention is not to breed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then, like, let's say we do have a breeding dog, um, male or female, once their reproductive job is done, like, for sure by seven, I still recommend, like, so now our pyometra risks shoot way up right. there. Right, right. And uh, males will get uh, BPH or benign prostatic hypertrophy, so their prostate will start to cause issues with urination and defecation, mm-hmm. things like that. They'll get cysts and abscesses yeah. in them. And the only way to fix that is to neuter them. Yeah. And yeah. the only way to prevent that is to, is neuter, to neuter them. them. So, yeah. 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 So, I mean, you know, neutered males can still get prostate cancer, unfortunately, but it's not super common. Right. Whereas benign prostatic hyperplasia is like 85% of dogs over the age of seven have it to some right. degree and it progresses right. as they age. Yes. And I would rather neuter a seven year old dog than an 11 year old dog. I agree. For sure. Yeah. Um, just if I were picky. So. <laughs> Um, okay, so what about the downside of spaying and neutering? You got any on that? Uh, mostly with the large breed dogs um, and how how their development goes. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, well, and like obesity, right? Yes. So um, a lot of times what happens with dogs that get spayed and neutered, people worry about them becoming overweight. Yeah. Um, which certainly we do see. Yeah, um, for so sure. Their metabolism changes. Yes. Um, and so, you know, you run into, oh, we don't want them to be obese either because there's so many health issues that can develop from that. Um, just alone, just like with people. Um, so really when your dogs are spayed and neutered, you want to do everything in your power to prevent them from becoming overweight. Overweight. Yeah, which a lot of times is just diet management. You just got to go into it knowing, like, they can't eat the same thing. And then a lot of it, too, is, like, puppies will eat so much more per pound of dog than an adult anyway, and you keep feeding them like they were a puppy, and then they just keep eating it because they like food. Yes. And um, so some of it is just the aging process in and of itself. But certainly there's no question that metabolism slows down in altered pets and so we have to be careful Mm -hmm. um with calories yeah and you really need to switch their puppy food around a year of age to adult food yeah because puppy food is high in calories and nutrients that adult dogs don't need um so if you don't switch them over you're just yeah overloading their bodies and uh, extra calories i will even switch them sooner on little dogs Mm -hmm. you know like the yorkies and maltese and chihuahuas like they don't need that stuff after nine months they don't they're done. They're their growth plates are, yeah, yeah, they're closed. It's over. Um, so, yeah. So, that's interesting um, to think about. And there are some spay, like, there's what's called cleverly, uh, the spay and neuter diet. Yes. <laughs> um, I, it's a Verback um, product, and you have to actually go to their website um, to order it. But it actually is really great because it does help the patient uh, feel less hungry um, it's like the right protein um, ratios for a spayed and neuter pet. Like, so they're more comfortable. It's not going to just bulk them up. They're not going to just get right. chubby real fast. Um, it's got fillers, you know, and things like that. So it's a really great diet for the, for especially the dogs that tend to be a little more prone to obesity. Mm-hmm. Right. So, um, yeah, the Labradors. Yes. <laughs> Those guys just like. Overweight labs. Yes. They're like little marshmallows. And daily. <laughs> yeah, unless they're hunting dogs. Um, so, yeah. That's interesting. And then I think one thing I want to debunk, because I'm really into debunking myths. I like it. Um, people will leave their in their males intact because they think that they will only be protective if they are intact. And that yes. is a myth. It is a myth. Um, you know, certainly when they're really young, being intact can have an influence as they grow. Like you said, Reuben started hiking at yeah. 11 months. And they can be like dog aggressive because they're intact. Yes. But as far as protective. That's that's really who they are. That's, that's a like mental thing. Yeah, and who yeah. they are, whether they have it or not. Mm-hmm. Um, being intact is not going to make your dog one way or the other mm-hmm. versus being protective. Um, but it can make them more animal aggressive, dog yes. aggressive for sure. Yeah, you have way more inter-household problems mm-hmm. uh, or neighbor dog problems if your pets are intact because right. that territorialism. Yeah, yeah. And when they go looking for 
females that are in heat, they're more likely to fight as yep. well because of it. So, yes. Yeah. Yep. So that's, um, yeah. So just like, because I think the reason I bring it up now is just like, why do people choose not to spay and neuter if, if they are not intending to breed? Because mm-hmm. obviously that would be the, the main reason to not spay and neuter is like, we want to breed. Right. But if you don't want to breed, the, that's one of the, the obesity is the number one complaint. And then people think their dog won't be protective if they're right. not you know, intact. Right. So, yeah. Um, other than that, I don't have like great reasons why you would not. There's not really, um, just because, I mean, we see it every day, the problems that arise from animals that aren't spayed and neutered. So true. Um, so we see it so much more than everyone else gets to because we see so many animals in a day. Right. Um, and so really being able to manage their food and their diet um, and knowing that it's not really going to change how protective they are of you um, can really change the story on when you neuter a spade pet. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Do you want to just take a couple minutes to tell people about the process of a neuter and a spade? Yeah. Yeah. So um, for for the puppies and kittens, um, you know, you you bring them in early, you bring them in pretty early, you know, fast them overnight depending on the size of the dog or cat. Um, And Basically what we do is blood work before they're sedated um, and anesthetized because we want to make sure everything's looking good. Yeah. Um, and then they get sedated um, and then they get anesthetized. So they get under general anesthesia, like if you were to go into a big surgery. Um, and then um, for neutering, it takes minutes. It takes yeah. very long. Um, and it's just a skin infection. The way that we do there, yeah. there are a couple of different ways to do them, but the way we do them is literally just skin. And skin. skin. Yeah. You're yep. not even going in the, in the tummy. Nope. You just open up around their scrotum and you get them out. Yep. But um, spays are a little more um, invasive. invasive. Um, that is because you do have to open up their abdomen um, and go in and pull the ovaries and the uterus out. Yeah, so in veterinary medicine, traditionally we do ovariohysterectomies, mm-hmm. meaning the ovary and the uterus are removed up to the cervix, um, which like is not the case in humans. Like They'll right. just do hysterectomies and leave their right. ovaries. Um, unless the hormones, yeah, yeah, unless you like have a hormone reason, like you know something going on with your ovaries that would warrant otherwise. Right. But the reason we choose to take out the ovaries and uh, the entire uterus in dogs is uh, to get those behavioral benefits, to decrease the risk of hormone fluctuations. Mm-hmm. We're not going to have stump pyometras where like even the cervix can get turned into the little pus balloon right. as we talked about. So yeah, it's it's very some some veterinarians do just remove either the ovaries i think is actually probably the more ovariectomy, yeah. yeah the ovariectomy yeah. and um and then those dogs are just in my opinion which is just my opinion and probably mm-hmm. dr Esep as well just sets them up for pios right um, yeah I, I think the thought process behind it is once you take away the hormonal influence the uterus the organ itself kind of starts to shrivel up and go mm-hmm. away but you're still dealing with tissue in the abdomen Mm -hmm. that's just now sitting there. Yeah. So currently, I believe that ABMA or the American Veterinary Medical Association still recommends a full ovarian hysterectomy. Um, So we we tend to here follow the AHA and ABMA guidelines Mm -hmm. as closely as possible. Yeah. Um, So once they're done with surgery, we wake them up. um, They spend the day with us so we can keep an eye on them, um, Mm -hmm. and then they go home. It's an outpatient procedure. They go home that afternoon. Yeah, we send them home on some Mm anti-inflammatories. They've had pain meds in their in their anesthetic protocol, yeah. so they, they they usually are doing great. I mean, the biggest thing is just, like, making sure they're not licking their incision sites because mm-hmm. yes, that's, that's, that's a pickle. That is. It can it can turn really bad really fast it if can. they lick their incision sites. Yeah, yeah they can get them infected. They mm-hmm. can dissolve their stitches. Mm-hmm. We do intradermal patterns, uh, meaning the stitches are inside the skin layer, so you don't actually have to do suture removals layer. Right. Um, but yeah, you don't want your dog like still licking them out. Oh yeah, they can lick enough to where they break the suture down and for female dogs, they can reopen their abdomen if they lick it enough. Yeah, yeah. I, I've seen it a couple of times over the, the past couple of decades, although to be honest, the, um, the ones that I have seen, the two, two that stand at my mind were both post x laps. So gotcha. they, the dogs had had exploratory surgeries where we had to, had to go in and, like, remove a sock from the intestines or something. And um, then those are already dogs that are a little bit... Right. They're 
out of control. Yes, <laughs> like, they're doing things they shouldn't they be. They already <laughs> uh, got the whole, you know, um, eating, licking, chewing thing mm-hmm. going. And so, um, yeah, they licked until they got their stitches yeah. open. And, but That's they good. were they were both fine. We, we fixed everything. Good. Well, you were there for Goliath. Uh, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, as a king corso, yeah. That was the day after the tornado, and we literally had to do a surgery with a headlamp. It was like a mash unit. Yes, but we gone did wrong. It. We did do it. Yeah. Um, anyway, that was wild. Um, okay, so, so yeah. I mean, that's the long and the short of it. Is you know, if you're not going to breed, spay and neuter your pets. Uh, bullet points are cats around five to six months. Um, same uh, for dogs that are going to be smaller breeds, anything under fifty pounds. Over that, we're going to try to push them closer to a year if mm-hmm. possible. Um, and then if you are using your dog for breeding, we would still recommend spay and neutering post their reproductive job, you yeah. know, so five, six, seven years old whenever you're done, uh, depending on the dog. And um, lots of lots of life benefits for that. And really the big thing is just, like, making sure we're monitoring their weight. Yes. Yeah. So I'm managing that. Yes. Yeah, so much to be benefited from in the spay and neuter. Um, if you're a Northside client and you're listening to this, we do have a um, this all month long a promotion for uh, Prevent to Litter Month, which is fifty dollars off spays and neuters. Yeah. So, yeah. so bring them in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're here to help. Um, if you guys have questions about it, if you're on the fence about it, if you don't know what to do, um, then just call us. That we're always here for questions. Yeah. That's that's all. That's you got it. anything else? Nope, that's it. Just yeah. Bob Barker signing off. <laughs> Stay new to your pets. That's right. Don't forget. It. Okay, bye guys. Bye. Hey, who wants some bonus content? If you're still listening, then uh, first of all, thank you. And secondly, another quick tale for you. We just, um, this week, a few days after recording this um, podcast episode, had a 12-year-old chocolate lab come in um, for some general ailment issues and actually had testicular cancer. So we have since neutered him um, and hopefully we've caught it in time uh, to prevent the spread, but just another kind of PSA, like even if these dogs are being used for um, reproductive purposes or if there are other reasons why you don't want to neuter um, still as that dog crosses that seven eight year old threshold we still encourage neutering to prevent things like the testicular cancer that we um, diagnosed this week so um, that's just a PSA but I hope y'all are having a good one holler if you need us bye